the one I like, the questions that make you squirm, make you earn. <laughs> That's a good one, actually. That's the title for this one. So, Julian, introduce yourself. Who are you? <laughs> I'm Julian. Uh, I work for the Onset as Associate Director. I've been here for five years now. Um, prior to that, I was, I was over in the UK where I was in recruitment for you know, another four or five years. How did you get in this? How did you fall in? I posted on LinkedIn about this the other day uh, and shared the story. It's my favourite interview question, but um, and someone threw it back at me. I definitely fell into it and I was definitely pushed into recruitment a little bit. But uh, pre-recruitment, I was working in environmental consulting. So basically I was on site. We won a contract with Jaguar Land Rover in the UK which basically meant we were helping support um, or reduce their carbon emissions off the back of research and development. So basically meant I was on site leading like project initiatives that, that would help them reduce like more crap, more waste into to be recycled. It, it was quite a cool job because it meant I got on site getting to see like all the cars being developed and tested from like clay models to like a working car on a test track. But I was a glorified bin man. <laughs> you know, I was literally going around the site trying to convince like ancient engineers that they need to get rid of their metal cans where they threw their oil filters, their apples, their paperwork all into one bin and convince them to segregate their waste into like different bit receptacles or bins. So it didn't pay particularly well because it was the automotive industry. The hours were really antisocial. Uh, it was just killing me. So I got talked to my brother Jay. He was in recruitment. I didn't really know a lot about what he did, but he was like, you should get into recruitment. So I went along, met a company called ISL in Bristol and just kind of went through the interview process with them. I didn't really know what recruitment was going into it. I knew it was kind of sales and was kind of what I was doing already. But uh, yeah, I, I didn't know what I was getting myself in for. I didn't grow up dreaming of it, but I'm, I'm glad I'm still doing it today. <laughs> uh, that's good. I don't think many of us, like when we were younger, what do you want to be when you grow up? Uh, I don't think the recruitment comes up on top of that list anyway. No, 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 no. Definitely fell into it, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad I did. I don't think I was glad for the first couple of years. Yeah. But I'm, I'm glad I'm still here now. It's funny one, I've uh, seen like 45% of people that get into recruitment leave in the first nine months. And this is probably, this is the first one of these, because if we can give some advice to somebody that is starting, it might help them get through the first couple of years. I think it's a massive learning curve and it, it, it's tough. And yeah, I, you know, going back to my first day, I remember like going on the phone and I was in another room and I just hadn't a clue and it was like, oh, oh, oh. so I still am like that today, but I think <laughs> it helps with the accent and people understand what I'm saying. But um, if you were to go back to day one, what advice would you give yourself? Yeah, so uh, I think the one thing that you need to figure out in recruitment really early on is you can go from absolute hero to zero, like overnight. I think I, I came in and I got quite lucky, you know, I, I worked hard, but I, I got in, I was really fortunate, I got a few deals away really quickly and like shot up the billings board and I just got too cocky, I got too high on the highs and I remember the one week like I, I was top biller for the month, like three months in and I was like, recruitment's easy, I got this <laughs> and literally I think one day I came into work, phone call drop out and was like it's okay it was only a small deal I'm still on my eye I'm still there and then literally my next phone call another drop out I'm like oh god and then it was just my big placement that was left and that like that was the the, the line share my billings for that month and it was a phone call and it was from the candidate I was like no surely not surely not and it was the candidate ringing to take up taking another offer so literally within the space of an hour I went from like top biller for the month to on bottom of the board again and like it was all the it was all the deals I needed to get me over the promotion threshold where I'd get like good comms and all the good things like that and uh yeah like all that confidence all that swagger went out the window and I was I was I was you know I was, I was having to ride the low and it killed me like but yeah like you're gonna have this early in your career like you're gonna get placements away there's questions you weren't have asked there's things you weren't qualified things you haven't considered and Shit's going to go wrong, but you kind of have to have those lows and those mistakes to learn. But you just need to be really good at being patient and resilient, I guess, around 
not getting too high on your highs and being able to ride your lows. I think that yeah. that was the thing that I I really struggled with. Yeah, because stuff just doesn't go your way sometimes, and that's what we get you know paid to deal with is the fallout of that. Champion and razor blades is the yeah, little thing goes. Blades, mate. Yeah. Was it? Uh, what would you say? That, what, do you have an idea of why they dropped out? Was it like were you pushing stuff, forcing stuff, or qualification, or what was it? Mate, it's literally qualification. You know, I, th- I think you've got to have like a really robust qualification process. You know, if you're not meeting your candidates, and I wasn't back in the day, like it was all just on the phone or over email, and because you're not qualifying everything, I wasn't qualifying everything to the nth degree. Like there was loads of surprises. You're early in your career. You you kind of like you're almost a bit desperate to make things happen. Yeah. You know, you're like you want that deal. You want to get the monkey off your back. You want to start earning commission, and you're just kind of pushing stuff along. And you're hearing what you want to hear rather than what you need to be hearing. Yeah. Um, and I think it comes with the territory of being new. But yeah, like it was absolutely the qualification. Like may have been asking the right questions, but just not listening to the answers or not ask, asking the right questions. And I think that knowledge bank of the questions that you gain, it does come with time, but like you wanna be in an agency where you've got like other good senior recruiters around you, people that you can hear on the phones, you can see what they're doing, you can you can kind of learn from them. Picking a couple good questions that you learn from them and just building that into your process every week. Like you're not, Rome wasn't built in a day, your qualification process is not going to be perfect in your first week. It's a build. So you just need to keep picking like small little improvements, mm. questions you can build into your process and just keep getting better. It's ever but, evolving. Asking yeah. hard questions, isn't it? Like you don't want to hear the answers sometimes, but if you don't ask the question, then it's like you're falsely going through a process and it can come back to bite you. Mate, you'll have had this again, like, asking the hard questions. Like, I guarantee back in the day, your boss will have said, oh, Sean, you've just got to ask the hard questions. And you'll have been like, give over, mate. It, grind, it does grind you, but like, they're absolutely right. And I can't look yeah. back. And think, it's, it's the best advice. You've got a good work rate and you've got a good qualification process. You spoke about three of your placements at the start. Is there any, I suppose I can maybe cover this, but is there any particular job or you know, client without naming them or placement that's made a lasting impression on you and why is it so memorable? They're all important, but I think the one or client that really, really stands out was like super early into my career. Again, like, you know, three months in was like trying to build my market, trying to get jobs on. And like I was just like hustling, working through calls and picked up the phone the CTO of this like medical device starter like I barely knew the guy's first name let alone what they did and I was like Dave got any jobs hi Dave <laughs> <laughs> and he was like I do but you know before I decide to work with you I just want to find out like what do you know about us and I was like shit and I was like <laughs> To me, like jumping on the computer, like trying to pull up their website, trying to regurgitate like the things mm. off the, the front page of their website to tell him what I think I know about the business. And Dave, his name was Dave. He was like, look, Julian, appreciate the hustle. Appreciate you reaching out to me. You clearly don't know who I am or what we do. He's like, I'm happy if you want to go away, do some research, decide if you actually want to work with us and then call me back and we can try this again. And I was like a bit embarrassed, but I was like, yeah, Fair enough. So I put the phone down, went and did some research, called him back and was like, I could have a more kind of level conversation with him then because I actually understood something about what the business did and what his role was. We had a really good conversation and he went on to be my best client in my first role in recruitment, worked with him for you know two, three years, loads and loads of placements with him. But throughout that whole time, like he was always pushing me and challenging me and helping me. And yeah, so it was definitely a memorable client and probably had the most impact in my formative recruitment years. Yeah, it sounds like a dream cold call. It's like, yeah, you, you're, you've completely missed it, but um, you know, let's try it again when you've given you some time to, to go and research. I think even two minutes research, I bet, you know, it helps even to position your call as well. Yeah. I think doing the research is important, but like being able to, I think what what I kind of, he was just a really good person to work with. He could have crucified me on that call, but he didn't. He was like, look, if you want to impress me, if you want to like, this is the stuff that stands out. So he didn't have to, he didn't owe me anything. 
He could have yeah. just told me to piss off, block my number, and never spoke to me again. Which is probably what I would have done, you know. But <laughs> yeah, instead, he actually took the time out of his day. He's a CTO of like a med tech startup. Like he's a busy guy, important guy, and he took time out of his day to kind of go, look, this is what you need to do. And it was like it was really helpful because that almost became a bit of a formula for me for mm. all of my other BD outreach. Yeah, you know, kind of learning from him, like what would stand out to him, what he was interested in hearing, what were the things I ought to be doing. That was really helpful. And so I kind of took a lot away from that. Like, you know, I got a bit of egg on my face and was really embarrassed. But yeah, it, it was definitely a defining moment in my recruitment career. It's good that it happened three months. And do you think that if, say, somebody is listening or reading this in their first year, should start to be like this whole fake it till you make it culture is gone, you know? It, do you find people should just say look this is i'm starting but uh, i know what you're looking for or i have some idea of the industry i'd love to hear feedback from you on how i can prove or do you find that something that you know obviously it's helped you would you encourage that from your team yeah 100 percent. like i think for anyone kind of new starting out like the, the the way i try and structure it is you need to learn your market and you need and more than your market you need to know your audience and the people you're talking to what what are the demographics what are the things that make them tick what are the things that they're interested in what's important to them you know what are the things that are serving their self-interests what are the problems they're solving because once you kind of understand that you know what your language needs to be you know what your pattern needs to be you know what medium to use and you just get a lot more cut through with all of your outreach you know whether it's candidate or client so yeah like i think again it comes to the qualification piece and being curious like knowing what works early on and figuring out a formula is really really important rather than just and, and some of that is like jumping head in head first and just asking questions being prepared to fail being prepared to look stupid you know asking stupid questions but yeah. you, you've just you've just got to do it yeah it brings a bit of human to it too. Like we can't all be polished, and even the polished do these days is a bit, it's a bit of an off-putting thing, really. It's like if you got somebody coming on and they're like asking the perfect questions, perfect pitch. It's like whoa, you get a bad feeling about it. I know I do personally. Maybe it's not, I'm speaking from my side, but when somebody is like, look, here I am, I, and I really want to help. I've got this idea of what you want, but you know I'm going to be upfront and where I'm at. You know that's that's key. Yeah, like, yeah, spot on. I think um, being overly polished, like, it's not, like, nothing needs to be perfect. I was, I was saying to the team the other day, is like, it's it's not necessarily what you say, it's, I guess, like, how many times you can say it. Yeah. You know, like, the, the, the repetition helps. Like, what yeah. you're saying doesn't always matter. Like, it, it can't be just chatting nonsense, but, like, yeah. you know, getting the perfect pitch doesn't matter as long as generally the content's accurate and what you're saying is accurate, it's actually how often you can say it and to how many people you can say it to, uh, and all those people, the right people, you know, you need a, you need a repeatable process that you can, you can you keep taking to market. It doesn't need to be perfect though. For sure. So and it's a perfect pitch. Yeah, nah, there's no, there's no such thing as perfect where we're, we're flawed or everybody's flawed in some way <laughs> um so on a bit of a different note you you know the, what i'm looking for speaking to people with that are go above and beyond and really like show evidence of that and you organize the techies who give us you know, techies who give a shit uh, yeah. can you tell us a bit about that journey and how it's impacted you as a, as a recruiter or give insights into that yeah so like I was um, techies a give a shit is like passion project of mine. You know, I, I was really lucky. I didn't start the group, but I was really lucky to inherit it from a chap called um, Jeremy Nagel. So he's a really interesting guy who's like just super passionate about tech that makes a lasting positive impact on the world. He built the community up pre-COVID, but like had a heaps of personal projects on the go. Like he's building his own business. He just didn't have like the time to keep it going. So. Me and him got chatting and we shared a lot of kind of values and interests. So I was really fortunate. I was able to kind of take the reins on the group. So like it's a we've got about 700 members. We run a series of events here in Sydney and uh, it's just a really good way to kind of give back to 
my market and you know my my audience or my community of engineers and founders so like i i leverage the group to kind of get out and talk to people i wouldn't normally talk to mm. so kind of targeting it towards like founders of like deep tech companies in around australia that just need a platform to come and talk about what they're doing so you know the people who've had come through are everything from like super early stage founders where it's just literally them and a co-founder through to you know we've built a product we've got customers we've got revenue and we're scaling and it's just a bit of like you know it's it's a good opportunity for them to come and tell their the founder story and what what their mission is and what their values are so it's it's a lot of it's a lot of work and i you know it's a lot of fun it was um it pushed me out of my comfort zone because i'm terrified or i was terrified of public speaking I remember the first event, like I'm sweating and shaking and I'm coming out on stage in my paper. But it was really good because it pushed me out of my comfort zone. It, it meant that I was there out talking to people that I wouldn't ordinarily be talking to, or wouldn't normally be in front of. And it's just, you know, been massive in terms of like actually building my brand and building a bit of recognition. You know, I think everyone that's spoken at my events, I've they've gone on to be clients of mine. And, you know, a lot of the audience have gone on to find jobs within those those organizations. So nice. it's helped my bottom line. It's helped me with my public speaking. I'm still not great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, it's 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 yeah, it's it's been great for for I guess branding. On that, so when we worked together, you were one of the first people I had heard talk about personal branding and building that and doing it a bit different. Um, you know, for me in the last year, I've tried to do more of this sort of stuff and it really, you know, similar to you with the public speaking and you end up chatting and getting up there and pushing yourself out there. It's, it's difficult, but how have you seen personal branding like influ influence your career? And what would you say to somebody maybe hesitant about posting on LinkedIn, I know we have had a few chats in the past and you've helped me overcome a lot of that. So what would you say to somebody maybe in their, you know, the first two years of their career that wants to give it a go, but maybe feels that, you know, I'm not a guru or, you know, an expert that we all see, but, you know, is there yeah. any advice you give to them? Yeah, yeah. Well, a bit, bit of backstory and context there. Like I was posting on LinkedIn before it was cool. <laughs> <laughs> Back at ISL, like when I first started out, like I'd be posting stuff on, on LinkedIn and like the guys around me were like, you can't put that on LinkedIn, you can't do that. And I was just posting memes. It was nothing particularly like profound or like offensive. It'd just yeah. be a meme or something related to a job or whatever. And it's because like no one's doing it. I was like, why not? Like, you know, everything on LinkedIn like 10 years ago was so dry, it was so vanilla. And I was like, people just don't communicate like this so i was like there's an yeah. opportunity to do something a little bit different and so i was i did i just started putting content out there and people started like messing me like oh, i like what you're doing this is really interesting i realized like like most people i don't love picking up the phone and doing bd yeah. what i found was like it was actually a really good tool to getting people to start coming inbound and reaching out to me um and so i kept doing it and like i wasn't very good some stuff would land some stuff wouldn't and like you just kind of figure out what works you know over time you get better yeah i you know i think your, your brand is so important and i think if you're a recruiter in the modern day and age like marketing social social marketing in particular is like so critical to your success like if you're not doing it like you're doing recruitment with one arm tied behind your back. Mm -hmm. like I did some analysis on this a little while back. And I think at the time, around 40% of my billings from that year originated from clients that had reached out to me off the back of like seeing me on LinkedIn. And I know for a fact that over 70% of my placements, candidates I've placed, they've come through LinkedIn or job adverts. So I, if I wasn't doing it, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have nearly half over half the billings I've got today. Nice. So that's it's, a big number too. Yeah, it's it's so important to like my my the way I operate and I think, you know, I think it's it's a missed opportunity if you're not using it. I think um like I've talked to a lot of people about it and like most people are like hesitant, like similar with my public speaking, like they're not they're, they're, they're scared of it because I haven't done it before and they don't know what works. They're worried about you know looking stupid or they're worried about not being witty or funny enough and what if my content doesn't land and stuff like that like that's all completely normal but that won't go away 
until you get started. Mm -hmm. So I think you just you just have to kind of start. Finally landed for me was realizing that most people just want to be entertained or they want to be informed, or they want to yeah. know something or they want to laugh. Like, you know, they just want a distraction. That's what social media is, right? So you, you just need to kind of figure out what does informative or entertaining look like? And it's not that hard. Like, you know, look, you, you can talk about your process. You can talk about, you know, your recruitment stories, the good and the bad. You know, you can, you can look at your market observations and predictions. Like anything can be content. You know, if you if you kind of sat down and you've actually kind of fleshed out like what are a couple of things I could post about and talk about and you're still struggling, like just get out and do some research, like look for other people on LinkedIn that are posting content. Like one of the my favorite phrases that I learned is God gave us eyes to plagiarize. <laughs> like <laughs> I'm not even just going out and stealing other people's content and, and reposting it, but like you know if you see an advert if you see a piece of content you're like i like that save it like that's like put it in an ideas folder you know go back to that and that can kind of be your inspiration go out and do some training like i think the stuff which where it really started clicking for me it wasn't a specific piece of training for social media but like you know mitch sullivan i did mitch sullivan's um copyright for recruiters training course and yeah. like you know, I think that that for me was where I really figured out what people like knowing your audience, I guess, tone of voice, um, using the kind of the right language, being making sure that what you're writing is way more, I guess, reader centric rather than writer centric. Yeah, you'd probably like chastise me because I don't think that's probably the right way to explain it. But like writing about your audience, writing about the per thinking about who's going to read this. And what do you want them to feel? What do you want them to think? And how do you want them to react? But yeah, get get out, start looking at content that you like, do some training, just start posting stuff. Yeah, you know? Mitch, yeah. um, I think he helped us, me as well. I don't have that course as well. So big up Mitch. Um, um, but if you were to, I suppose, talking a bit more about you and your career again, is there anything that you stand out of being most proud about um, or proud of? Um, I don't know. Two, like, two cars maybe you have? <laughs> <laughs> they, like, i tell you what. So when I first got into recruitment, like recruitment, like, let, let's call a spade a spade. Like there's a lot of recruiters out there that they were give, do the industry a disservice shitty ethics like doing a crap job ghosting candidates ghosting clients dropping the pants on fees and then not filling work you know i think and because of a lot of like the bad practice in the industry i used to be you know quite ashamed to tell people i was in recruitment you know go mm -hmm. to a party and, like, oh, what do you do for work oh, oh it's work in recruitment like, I, I don't want to tell people yeah. but now I'm, I'm actually really proud of it because without recruitment you know i wouldn't be here in australia like this is home for me now like it's created opportunities for me that i never would have had you know it's secured my future in australia i love where i live i love what i do you know it's afforded me a lifestyle which i definitely wouldn't have had if i carried on taking the bins out for jaguar <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, definitely I've, met, I've met some amazing people yeah like i think I, I think just in general like the fact that i've stuck it out and still doing what i do today yeah, it's insane. Like it's you know, the when you get over that slump of maybe the first couple of years and it clicks, you know, and you can actually impact people's lives, so to speak. You know, if you're somebody struggling for a job and you get them, so you, like I've had people where you answer the phone and they're like, "I've been promoted twice," and you just get that really good feeling. And if you don't have that, and if it's all about the cash, then you're probably I don't know, you're probably going to end up getting some cash, but pissing a lot of people off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. Like, uh, it, yeah, you, the, the, the money helps in recruitment, like, absolutely. But, like, if it's the only reason you're doing it, yeah, you won't. I don't think you'll be around long because the returns like that, they, they don't, like, you don't, like, let's, let's be honest, like, your first couple of years, like, you ain't, you ain't shooting the lights out, yeah. you know, Things are gonna go wrong. You've got to you've got to earn your stripes. Yeah, um, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, is there anything you know if you were to work with a candidate or a client, 
be any red flags for you that you know would, that you would tell people to avoid? You know, if you're looking for a role, is there anything that you, you would say to people maybe don't do that? So what, like if I, if, if red flags in candidates and clients I work with, or yeah, so for example, if somebody's not going to take a briefing, you know, or doesn't want to get on the phone with you, or you know, if you're a yeah. candidate, maybe trying to push yourself into an interview and then you get into the interview and you haven't actually got any hands-on experience with DevOps is that, you know, stuff like that. Is there anything yeah. in particular that stands out to you? Yeah, definitely. Look, I think people that don't respect what you do or your time, you know, I think me and you, we've talked about this loads in the past, but like that master servant relationship. Yeah. I, you know, you might not, this might not click early on, but like at the end of the day, like we're, we're consultants, like we're going in to fix problems for people, you know, those problems obviously centered around hiring, but if you're not getting the face time and the engagement and the buy-in from the people that you're fixing the problems from, you're never going to fix those problems. And because you're not fixing those problems, they blame you, but it's not actually your fault because well, it is because you're responsible for making that judgment call on whether you work with them or not. But like, if someone's not going to give you the time of day to kind of explain to you, like give you context, you can't get in and fix their problems around hiring. That's something I've always been really fixated on, like ever since I got into recruitment is like, if I can't, you know, jump into a room with you, jump on a call with you, a video call with you to actually understand your business, your vision, your values, you know, your process, then I won't work with you. Yeah, it's not going to work, is it? You know, like I've had clients like, oh, we'll pay 25%, but, you know, here's a job spec, you know, yeah. just pick in whatever CVs you can find. It's like, no, sure. <laughs> like, you couldn't pay me all the money in the world to do that kind of recruitment because it ain't yeah. recruitment. Yeah. It's, it's crap. But, and it, and it takes yeah. up your time and it takes you away from actually what your focus is and your... You know, I've I've done it in the past when I started out. Like you, know, yeah, I've got a role on, but really, is it a role? Is it? You know, if you're not getting a full briefing, it's like semi CVs. It's like, well, yeah, you're not serious as well about hiring this person. Yeah, yeah. Like, how can you expect someone to go and spend, you know, you know, that that the whole week dedicated to kind of building out shortlist, interviewing people, vetting people? coming back to you and then and then taking their trust in you into a business where it's like I don't even know if they're gonna respond to me. I don't even exactly. know if they're gonna come back to me for feedback. It just spirals out of control. If you don't have any control over the process because you don't have that buy in, that's yeah. on you and that's your fault. But yeah, don't 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 work with people that don't respect you and won't give you the time of day. Um it just never ends well. Um, sure, for sure. And look last question. I obviously have to get some AA questions in there, but now, do you what? What's your views on it? Like, do you think it's going to be good, bad, not really change much, or what do you think? Mate, I think the like when we talk about AI, I guess like it's automation, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's like I don't think a robot is going to come along and replace recruiters. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I do, you know, we're dealing with people, and people want to deal with people. But like automation it doesn't matter whether you're in recruitment or anything else like there's a huge opportunity there to kind of use really really good tools like cloud recruit floats ai <laughs> we cut that can we edit that and like yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you might have to rebrand your business mate no um you know using but tools like floats ai which can they they, they can automate parts of your job and make you, your life easier like I think it comes back to the quality of your data. Mm -hmm. So like if you're putting good data in and you're building sensible automation around that data and it's logical um, and you know, the content you're sending out or the CVs you're sending out, it's going to the relevant and the right audience. Yeah. There's a huge opportunity. If you're just putting crap data in, you're going to get crap results out. But again, like like your branding, like I think if you're not using automation in the right ways, you know, uh, you're missing a trick. But it's yeah, it's it's a really powerful tool for for saving you time and getting you better results, better outcomes across the board. You know, whether it's job leads, whether it's reverse marketing, some really targeted reverse marketing candidates, whether it's you know, automating like a really repetitive task. Yeah, AI is something most recruiters should be using as part of the process. It's given time back to, you said something earlier about meeting candidates in person and meeting people, meeting people. And I've, I completely agree with what you just said there. It's more about 
if I can get away with the shit task so that I can go and have a coffee and get to know someone or take a full briefing and you can do that more and meet more people. And then, uh, you know, there's tools there that help you with that, you know, not just, you know, look, look at MetaView, for example, it allows me to have a real, a real conversation with you without taking notes and I can't multitask. So it's, it's just, you know, it's not so much here, this is a tool or a platform to do the job for you. It's actually to allow you to get more time to do it right, I feel. Yeah, yeah. Mate, a hundred percent, like it's it, like it's saving you time. Well, I'll give you an example. Like I sat down with a, one of the guys on my team yesterday, got a, got a couple of people through an interview process. The second favorite on the short list, like obviously didn't get the offer. But she's like, this dude is awesome. I've got to place him somewhere. I was like, cool, what are you going to do with him? She's like, I don't know. I was like, well, where can you send him? Like, I don't know. Yeah. And like, well, imagine you had a tool like where you could input a load of data around. These are the hiring managers that we work with. These are the skills they look for. And then you could send that CV, you know, create some automation around sending that CV out to those managers. You know, it's one email. It's personalized. It's targeted to like 10 different people. Wouldn't be great if there was a tool around that could do something like that for you. <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is just not a big advertising. Totally. <laughs> uh, cool, mate. Well, thank you. Look, that was brilliant. It was really some really cool insights there, honestly. And um, I suppose you mentioned it to me. It wasn't something I, I came up with, but would you advise me to speak to with anybody else that maybe is not in your business, but maybe someone you've worked with previously or someone that you learned um, a lot of, maybe the hard questions. Get Mitch Sullivan on. Yeah, <laughs> he is. I, I've been speaking to Mitch about a few different things and um, yeah, I don't know if he would be keen, but we'll try. <laughs> I will see. He is, you see, he had such a big impact and even introductions over the last year, like, if there's anything that I can recommend from his side is do the course, you know, it will give it, I, I, he, I was speaking to him recently and he was like, look, I'm just kind of looking for feedback on it. And, you know, I don't know with the job ads in mind, but every message that I write now, you go back through the process of what you learned. And it's like that no bullshit factual kind of properly given information. You know, I feel like there's a lot of fluff that goes around, but I'll 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 try to see if Mitch or hopefully he sees this and he reaches out. <laughs> uh, yeah, you you you're all to. I was I was, I was thinking about this the other day because I knew this question was going to be coming, and I've like I've really struggled to land on an answer. Yeah. <laughs> well, any loads of good recruiters, Jay's pretty Jay. much what we give him. Jay's, <laughs> Jay's a recruiter, but like you've already got the better Vignal, so he's <laughs> not on the short list. We'll definitely, we'll definitely have to give Jay a shout. Uh, you know, Chris, Chris, Chris Coulthard, like he's, he, he's, he's great at what he does. He's, you know, he's, he's built a great following and a great audience on LinkedIn. Like he'd be, you know, he's, he's a good manager. Like he'd be a good, great person to talk to. Yeah. We obviously both work with Ross and Ronnie. Like they're both. Nice, the boys. Hey. 